bringing you a steady stream of thought-provoking ideas and cutting-edge innovation. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Well, thank you for joining us on our inaugural number one episode. And Brian and I, as we said in the, the episode zero, have a long list of exciting people to talk to, ideas to talk about. And as we look over the spreadsheet we have compiled, I, you know, I, the Chris, Chris Matthews term from Obama in 2008, the, the shiver up my leg, you know, comes to mind. And if you haven't seen that clip, go Google uh, shiver up my leg, Chris Matthews. It's, it's rather hilarious, but um, it's exciting. We have a lot of fun stuff to talk about, but you know, when I did these uh, Tuttle Twins books, we'll be talking about in a future episode, Elijah and I, the illustrator, sat down and we said, if we're going to do uh, this series, what is book number one going to be? And we decided to do Frederick Bastiat's The Law because it was such a formative book for both of us. We wanted to kind of pay it homage, as it were. And as we did the same thing with this list of episodes for the podcast, we said, well, okay, we got to start somewhere. What are we going to start with? And Tom Woods was obviously at the top of the list. Um, he is uh, someone who... For any of you listening to podcasts, if you're not already subscribed, you're going to be by the end of the, the show here. It is a phenomenal podcast. He's had me on as a guest uh, many times. Brian has interviewed him in his past radio career. Um, and so we're very excited to welcome Tom Woods on the show. Thanks for being with us. Very glad to be here. So uh, I wanted to talk about something a little different with Tom. Tom has a very uh, storied uh, career and profession. Uh, you're the author of many best selling books on uh, politics and government and history and so forth. Um, you're a former college professor. You've got this Liberty Classroom website, um, all these things that I imagine will intersperse into what we talk about ahead. But rather than just talking about who you are or what you do, I wanted to add a twist because you and I have talked a lot, Tom, and, and I think we both find ourselves, and Brian too now actually, in careers that we weren't in before. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you transitioned. So if you would, maybe kind of fill in the gap of what I talk about with your own bio. Who are you and what did I miss? But more importantly, let's begin talking about what was that transition like in getting from what you were trained to do and used to do into what you're now doing today? It's very funny you asked me that because one of the guests on my podcast told me off the air the other day that I gave him some very unusual advice years ago. He was considering going into law school or being a professor or he had this slight itch that maybe he could be an entrepreneur. And he said, but I'm not really sure I have what it takes to do that and I don't know what I'm doing. And I responded, yeah, I agree. That's why I'm in academia. You know, and that was my answer. I actually basically told him, don't do that. And so now, of course, I would not give the same advice because I've had very good experiences uh, in the world of entrepreneurship. But basically, you know, I started off in a traditional academic style career, and then I was at the Mises Institute for four years, which I loved very, very much. And then in 2010, we moved, and I needed to – figure out how to make a living without getting a regular salary. And it was a trial by fire, really. And at first I thought, well, I'll just do a lot more of what I used to do in my spare time, which was public speaking. So I was flying around the country like a lunatic. And I thought, that's that can't be right. Then somebody proposed to me, why don't you create a product? And I thought, creating a product sounds just sounds like something other people do. That's not something I do. I consume products, you know, crazy geniuses create them. What are you talking about? But then I, I thought, well, the person said to me, think about what your strength is and what have people in your audience enjoyed about what you've been doing. And, well, they like to hear me talk about history because they feel like I will give them the real history instead of the politically correct version. So why don't you create a product around that, you know, create some courses. So. Connor, you actually helped me, of course, with the technical end. I created LibertyClassroom.com, which just had its five-year anniversary. It's still going very it's been that strong. Long. Wow. Yeah, it was. It, we were working on it in 2011, and it opened in 2012, and it's gone really, really well. So that's something that brings in passive income for me. I, I'm walking down the street, and oh, somebody just joined Liberty Classroom. So that's great. But then beyond that, I realized, well, you know. <laughs> You got one source of income. Why not have two? Why not have three? Why not have four? So I also have realized that given my audience, I have products that I can promote that will make their lives better and that will help me raise my five kids. And so one of them, as you know, I've worked very, very hard on the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum. So I have an affiliate deal with them that anybody can get 
where every time somebody joins through that link, I get 125 smackers. And I get 125 smackers every year that family renews. You'd be crazy not to do this. So I, I have, I'm particularly credible on this because I created courses You're for that part program. Of it, right. Yeah. So I, you know, I set up a sales page and I get traffic through Google AdWords and Facebook advertising and through my podcast and whatever. And that generates a substantial amount of dough. I mean, it's expensive to have five kids and I, I need to generate the dough. So the point, and I could give many other examples of this, but the point is given that the internet exists, you would be crazy not to figure out how to use it in a way that it could be monetized. That the basic thing that you can do that if, if you say, well, I don't know what to do is you have an opt-in page where people give you their email address and you, you, you write a little ebook or you, you outsource that or you, you make a couple of videos on some topic and you give them away for free in exchange for people's email addresses. And then you follow up with those people with affiliate offers. And th that really is the basic model for how anybody can do something online that generates a little bit of extra dough. You tweak it according to your own interests, but really that's the basic model and that's how I've been doing it. And I would not change this for the world. In, I, when I used to be a professor, I would be teaching 35 people at a time. And, uh, you know, 10 of them were so oblivious, they might as well not even have been there. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was not it, it was not ideal. Whereas now I have an audience in the, it, you know, in the five and six figures on a regular basis, watching my videos, listening to my program. And I'm also able to support myself without having to sit on bureaucratic committees, without having to do things that make me miserable. I set my own schedule. I, I go on vacation when I want to. I can't imagine living any other way. So I've actually enjoyed showing people how I do it, how I, you know, again, like, for example, with the Ron Paul curriculum, I've shown people, here's where I get the traffic from. Here's the here's the program. Here's where here's how the money comes. And and because I, I would like to see other people have that kind of success so they don't have to do go, you know, go to some job they hate every day. Tom, I've got a question for you as this pertains to um, a person who, who wants to be secure in what they're doing. And I don't mean just simply, you know, collecting a paycheck, but uh, there's a, there's almost a game that takes place today. If someone says something that is deemed politically incorrect it seems like the hounds are unleashed, and, and it, it's sport to destroy people, to destroy their careers. It seems like if, if a person were to step out of that uh, employee mindset and more into that entrepreneurial mindset that you're describing, they would largely be immune from those kind of forces, wouldn't they? Yeah, they, they largely would, and that is definitely one of the uh, – another benefit. I don't have to worry about a thing. I can say what I think, and, and uh, you know people can take it or leave it. But I don't have to worry that, well, if I say what I think, that my kids don't eat. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about that. And that is a tremendous burden off someone's shoulders, particularly when it's somebody like me with a big mouth who can't <laughs> stop talking, who can't not say what he's thinking. You know, yeah, you're darn right it's nice to know that regardless, those automatic affiliate commissions are going to keep coming in while I'm asleep, while I'm at the beach, while I'm having dinner. I get email notifications saying you got a commission for this, for this, for this. And they're all things that I can promote with confidence and feel good about because I use them or I made them. Yeah, that's that is you're darn right. That is a big advantage. Now, Tom, you said at the outset, you know, your initial thought was, well, I, I that's for other people to do. I that's not me. I'm a college professor. I'm an author. I'm a you know public speaker. How did you overcome that, right? Because I imagine right now listening, there are people who are stuck in a rut, who hate their dead-end job, who have passions and interests outside of what they do to get that paycheck. And they're listening and they're thinking, well, oh, yeah, but that's just Tom Woods. He's you know crazy genius and very productive, and he knows people, and he can make things happen, not me. How do other people listening overcome that same fear that you did? Well, for me, I overcame it because uh, there was no money coming in. So you know, I had no choice. <laughs> of necessity. I I have to figure out what to do here. And and I think it was um, – oh, now I can't think of his name. But he's that guy who's always got a million good ideas and he's he's a – I can't think of his name. But anyway, um, I think of his ideas more than I think of his name. But he was saying that when you're up against a wall is when you tend to to generate ideas like crazy. Like you really have to generate the ideas. So that was really what made me put, made me start thinking – there must be another way. But then, well, how did I figure out which, you know, what was that other way? Right. Well, certainly the podcast 
is what keeps my audience. It gives my audience something new from me every single weekday. And that's a great thing. But not everybody has to have a podcast. But I had a blog and I just, you know, I just tried to stay active, make videos, do things that get yourself out there. And eventually, if they're any good, they get shared and then other audiences get exposed to them. And little by little, you build up your little tribe that's going to support you and that's going to make your livelihood possible. And I started looking around. I, I want to see how are other people doing this? How are people? Because I, I thought the Internet obviously is is a ridiculous way to make a living. I mean, ridiculously, I don't want to say easy, but you'd be crazy not to at least give it a try because look at all the free tools. You can put a video promoting a product up and it costs you nothing. What, what, what kind of crazy stuff is this? Of course I'm going to do this. So I wanted to see how are other people doing it. So I found Pat Flynn, who has the Smart Passive Income podcast. Right. And I just started listening. I just started, you know, I, it wasn't like, oh, I'm Tom Woods and I've written books on completely unrelated topics. Therefore, I'm a, I'm a natural to be an entrepreneur. I was not. But I just, so I just wanted to learn what are other people doing. And I read everything I could. I absorbed everything I could. And when I saw what Pat Flynn was earning every month, through his online work. It's motivating. And from one, yeah, from one particular affiliate program, in particular, he was earning tens of thousands a month. I said, all right, I'm a smart guy. I'm going to get a piece of that because I, I can also provide value to people and earn commissions while I'm doing it. I'm going to do that. And so sometimes people will write to me and say, well, Woods, how do I get started doing the sorts of things that you're doing? And then I lay out, well, here are the things you need to do. And then they come back at me with, oh, really? Like they, <laughs> it's like they want me to give them a get-rich-quick scheme. But if I did, they'd say, hey, Woods, that's a get-rich-quick scheme. <laughs> okay, but then when I give you the get-rich-slowly scheme, they all say, oh, work. Drudgery. See, not, not me. When I saw what was possible online, when I looked at the example of Pat Flynn, I didn't say, oh, that's going to be so much work. I said, okay, now I know exactly what I need to do, and I am going to move mountains to make that happen. That is the correct attitude, not the, oh, why don't you just turn the key and do everything for me? No. Once you know what to do, then you make that spare time and you do it. Tom, let me ask you this. My experience is a little different than yours, but similar in ways where um, I find myself doing things that I didn't go to school for, I didn't used to do. I used to be a web developer, right? You mentioned I helped you build Liberty Classroom. That, that used to be my career, my nine to five and, you know, I found satisfaction actually in it, in the technical challenges, uh, the, the learning that I did, the people I worked with. But at the end of the day, uh, with probably the exception of you and a few other freelance clients I had where I was working on things that I supported philosophically and ideologically, I was working on stupid, you know, websites selling products that I didn't care about, right? And so I didn't have that type of personal fulfillment in it. And now then, let's see, 2011, I started Libertas Institute. So now I'm a, a nonprofit executive, right? <laughs> like, I, I, I didn't go to school for this. There's no book about it. I didn't have a mentor to hold my hand. And nevertheless, you know, I'm doing it. And so the question I have for you is, um, how, how do you, it's tough, right? Because it's one thing to say a financial necessity. We find ourselves now suddenly doing something else. But on the other hand, we, we have to learn almost by making mistakes and failing along the way. So how is it that you've experienced failure and is it something that you're comfortable with? I, I sense that a lot of people's fear about taking that step into the unknown is the fear of, of falling down and making a mistake. Do you see, have you had to kind of see the upside of making mistakes that you kind of embrace that or how does that work for you? Okay, well, first of all, just to calm people down about that, the nice thing about the Internet is that unlike with a brick-and-mortar store where you have to go out and take out a big loan and then you have to buy all your products and put them on a shelf, and there's a whole lot of overhead involved, there doesn't have to be a whole lot of overhead for at least as you're getting started with an online business. You just need an email autoresponder and a landing page builder. I mean, that really is it. And then you just test and see if you can get some traffic, and, and that's it. So you don't have to... Be as where I would be a nervous wreck if I had a retail store, particularly in 2017. Right, forget it. So, all right. So, how do we worry about how do we deal with failure and how have I dealt with it? Well, I on, on I have two email lists, and one of them is for libertarians, and one of them is where I talk about um, you know how I earn a living online. In fact, I just sent out an email a few days ago. Here are three affiliate programs that pay my bills. Well, a lot of people open that one up. <laughs> they want to know what are they. So 
I do that, but I so but I also have on that list talked about failures that I've had, and my favorite failure because it was such. It, it was such a failure. It was almost a work of art. It was so failing. It was amazing. It was Liberty Classroom was going pretty well at the beginning. But I thought, you know, if I'm just going to limit myself to my audience when there are billions of people on planet Earth, that's uh, that's a constraint I don't necessarily want to be confined by. So let me see if I can reach out to a broader audience. So I pitched uh, and I said to the people at uh, Glenn Beck's show – because, okay, I know Glenn Beck has his issues, but there are some people who listen to him who would like Liberty Classroom. Right. So, and, and they're not my existing audience. That's the whole point is I want to go beyond Throw my existing audience. audience. Yep. Yeah. So I built a landing page or I had some somebody build a landing page just for Glenn Beck listeners. Uh, I had a discount for them. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. It's such a beautiful, attractive landing page. It's going to be great. So they ran the ad. It brought in zero. Signups. Now, when I say zero, I don't mean it brought in like six or seven and I'm rounding it down to zero. I mean nothing. I mean a donut, nothing. So I, I, even the ad people at the Glenn Beck thing said, all right, this is weird because this is a good thing and I don't see what's going on here. So I had to at that point figure out what went wrong. You've got to learn from that mistake. What the heck happened that that was such a stinker? And I real and I found out later on. Here, here's basically what happened. I did not know the difference between cold and warm traffic. This is cold traffic. These people have no idea who Tom Woods is. They're being taken to some landing page, and they don't know who I am or if I'm trustworthy or whatever. Whereas my existing audience, they listen to me every day. They they know, yeah, of course I like what Woods is doing, and he has a product. I'm going to go buy it. Of course, the average person is not going to say that. Secondly, I didn't give them nearly a big enough discount. This is an annual product for you know roughly a hundred bucks, depending on what level you join at. You got to give them at least fifty percent off, maybe even seventy-five percent off in the first year to get a cold person off that fence. And then, moreover, what you might even do instead is not even send them to an order page. You send them to an opt-in page where you say, "Hey, I'm going to give you a free course on the U.S. presidents and how crummy they've been." And all you got to do is give me your email address and I'll send you the course. And then once they've given the email address, you then follow up with them, follow up with them until you make the sale. And of course, you have to know how to send good emails. If all you send them is sales pitches, they're going to hate that. You got to send them infotainment that concludes with a pitch. But anyway, that was the problem. I was sending cold traffic, people who did not know me. And then I wasn't giving them a good enough deal, considering that they don't know me. And instead, I should have been building an email list with it or giving a, a, a deeper discount or whatever. Uh, and then I also realized, you know, I still hadn't really tapped my full audience. There's no shame in just going to your audience. And yeah, my audience is not 8 billion people, but the, I had barely scratched the surface of it. And I was already salivating for bigger audiences. I should have stuck to my knitting, stuck to my audience and just cultivated more warm traffic to the offer. Tom, it strikes me as funny that here you are, a former you know, history professor and author, and I, I imagine what it must be like for maybe one of your former students who's used to hearing you in that little capacity, that, that kind of narrow capacity, hear you talk about online marketing and all the expertise you've developed. How do you feel like doing something new? Does that feel like a different life, or is it something that you've kind of blended together and you, they kind of fit hand in glove, or what's that like? Well, I think I think it fits hand in glove, but I wouldn't say that if you're a libertarian, you have to. There are some people who go so far as to say, you know, you can't work for a boss. Sure, you can. That's that's your voluntary choice. So I don't go to that extreme. But I think there's at least a, you know, at least a distant relationship between the two things. And for me, it certainly fit because I feel like I can't spend all my time just theorizing about how great capitalism is right. and then not actually really doing it. So I feel like when you're out there doing email marketing and building email lists and building opt-in pages and, and tweaking offers and doing split tests, to me, that's thrilling. And, and in fact, I don't even get people who don't think that's thrilling. That's <laughs> exciting. You know, if, if I tweak this page a little bit and the conversions increase by 3%, I'm fascinated. Why did changing the background color get me more sales? I don't have to know the answer, but I'm curious. You know, things like this. In fact, I was at my 25-year high school reunion a couple years ago, and it turns out one of my old friends is now doing marketing for Procter & Gamble. We must have spent half an hour 
talking about split testing and tweaks and this and that and what works and what doesn't and and whether you have a buy button or a this or that. And we just loved it. No one else could understand why we were that interested in it. So, uh, yeah, I I have have transitioned into it very nicely. I because I, I just find it interesting. What makes people buy something? Uh, what gets them interested? What what is the process by which the person goes from cold to warm to hot? I don't see why somebody wouldn't find that interesting. So, but when I talk about it on my show, I generally confine it to a bonus episode on the weekend, so I don't get gripers saying, "Well, I want my show on privatizing the roads instead of this." So you get your five episodes. But I, I, I think this is great. Like I've had twice on my show, I've had Ben Settle on, who is one of the email. kings of, of email. Yeah, I mean, he could sell you. You don't even have a dog. He makes you want to buy dog food, right? I don't even like golf. I want to go get a driver and get out to the driving range. When I read Ben's emails, I've had him on twice. He doesn't have an affiliate product that I'm promoting. I just find him fascinating. This is a guy who writes a couple of emails a day, and then he has a print newsletter. But that's all he does pretty much. He earns a very comfortable living, and he has helped people like me earn very comfortable livings. I think that's great, and I, I get emails all the time from people who say, thanks to you and your constant badgering, I've started something, and it's going great, and I never would have done it without you. This is wonderful to me. I'm glad to hear that. But for people who aren't interested, okay, keep that to yourself. You're not interested. I'm still giving you five free episodes a week. Uh, that's not too bad. Tom, I've got a question for you that's more of a, a big picture question. I've followed your work for a long time, and I think like a lot of people, what drew me to your work was you, you have passion, um, there's quality, you, you always have added value. And I've, I've watched with interest, as Connor mentioned, you know, the, the shift as you've gone from author and history professor and speaker to uh, you, you are a guru when it comes to, to really maximizing opportunities. What's the bigger picture for you? I mean, the, the common thread that runs through all this is you're accomplishing something significant with your life. What, uh, what's the main goal? Oh boy. Well, I mean, I have big picture goals and I have immediate goals. I mean, I, I have, I have, uh, a lot of lost causes that I am fighting for, <laughs> and, you know, and they usually lose. Um, I just today, uh, or recently I had a, a released on a, uh, Catholic website. I wrote, I don't write that many articles anymore. I just, I send emails to my list. I don't write that many articles, but it's the 10th anniversary of uh, Pope Benedict the 16th's liberation of the old Catholic mass, removing all the restrictions that, that existed on it for a while and saying those people who prefer to worship in the older way could, should just go ahead and do it. And that was a big deal to me because that's one of the seemingly lost causes I've been fighting for years. And when that, when I actually won that one, I, I almost didn't know what to do with myself. Wait a minute. I won. That does so. I, so I stop writing about this now. Like, that, is, is that what you do when go you win home. something? You just yeah, right. I go home. Like, what am I doing out here in the rain collecting signatures? We just won. I guess I go home now. So that was kind of exciting. So there are. So I yeah, I have big like big goals like that. I mean, things that have to do with the the ultimate meaning of life ultimately. Um, and of course, I want more and more people to understand that the you know what they've been told by state education. It's just not right that that we're all just helpless boobs and where would we be if we didn't have uh, people helping us out, uh, you know, by providing all these government services to us. I, I, I don't want people to believe that because it's an insult to them and because it leads to all kinds of bad consequences. And I want to tell the truth about war propaganda. I mean, these things matter to me a lot and they matter to my kids who observe me doing them and really appreciate that their dad does things like this. Now, on a more mundane level, um, if you can call this mundane, I also want to help people, if they're interested, to figure out ways that they can, uh, you know, build up another income stream or something. Like I just told you, the, the Ron Paul curriculum. People could do what I'm doing with that. They just don't. There's no reason somebody else couldn't also promote that exactly the way I do and make commissions on it exactly the way I do. They just don't want to put in the work. So, but but you will prosper with that if you put in the work, because because I'm prospering with it, and I'm just as human as you are. So there's no reason you can't do it either. So I do want to show them that because I also want I also teach my own kids this stuff. Like I'm constantly teaching them. Well, here's how I earned the money to pay for this outing while we were on the outing. How did that happen? And I teach them 
uh, these sorts of things. The, uh, my, one of my kids is, is making uh, products to, for sale on Amazon, and I reminded her like, of just these basic insights that don't think to yourself, oh, this is a really cute design. People should really like this. No. You should instead research what are people buying now? What are they drawn to? What have they indicated that they want? That's the th You can't be self-centered. Here's what I think they should want, and they're wrong if they don't want it. You, that's the wrong way to think. But yet that's a way I could imagine children or even adults thinking that, well, here's a nice thing. I don't see why people wouldn't like it. That's not the path to success. So I teach them this stuff because I want them to be able to, even if they go into traditional careers, I want them to have a fallback. I want them to have that extra income stream or two or three or four to support them if things go wrong. And frankly, it's helped. it helps me a lot that I can stop what I'm doing for a month and yet still get by. And that's amazing. I took I was a workaholic to the point where I hated and resented going on vacations. This went on for years. Bitterly hated it. And and when I would be surrounded by people wearing Hawaiian shirts, I just wanted to wring their necks. I thought these were frivolous people. I don't want to spend time with them. Well, I still don't really want to spend time with a lot of those people. But the point is, I, I was I was just deranged. I was so addicted to work. So in June of this year, I took all but five days off. The, almost the entire month we were vacationing in one place or another. And then you know, for a good chunk of the day, I could look at my phone and the the notifications that somebody just bought the Ron Paul curriculum or somebody joined Liberty Classroom or somebody bought some other thing that I promoted. And it pays for every single day that we're gone. And I, I would love other people to have that because that's a because that that helped our family. Right. Our family had great, great times together during that month. Tom, this is amazing. I want to ask one final question. It relates to what you just said, so I imagine you'll be able to kind of repackage it into an answer, and that is I want to understand from you um, what the relationship is between entrepreneurship and freedom. As you said, you know, you preach capitalism. You're a guy talking about the ideas of freedom all day long on your podcast, and yet here you are putting them into practice. And so how in your mind are the two connected? And to that point, if we're going to increase people's awareness about freedom, do you feel that we also need to be preaching the message of entrepreneurship so that they have financial independence as well? Well, so, uh, to the last thing, uh, definitely, because I think it's so easy, especially going through government schooling, to get caught in a very conventional way of thinking and acting, that we think that the way to do it is you you look at the clock and you say, well, kindergarten plus 12 years have now passed, so I have officially done what is expected of me, and I've gotten the piece of paper. Now I go do thing the next, I go do the next thing that is officially expected of me, and then once I have that piece of paper, I just sit and wait by the telephone. Now that does work for some people. I'm not saying that never works, but it doesn't work as much as it used to. It doesn't work as much as it did when I graduated from college, for example. You're going to need something that's a little bit more out of the ordinary if you really want to succeed and not be, uh, you know, a, a constant wreck worrying about your job security all the time. So, in terms of the relationship between entrepreneurship and freedom, well, of course, you know, a lot of times, I mean, we think of the ways that our lives have been improved, made more comfortable. That's not coming about because government officials in, innovated in some area. It's because some entrepreneur had the liberty to innovate and had the liberty to enjoy the fruits of his innovation. And so there's, you know, that's a connection right there. And then, of course, if we're thinking of freedom in a more colloquial sense, not simply as the absence of, co of political coercion, but we think of it in a more colloquial sense that I'm free to do what I want, let's say, because I have the, the material means to do it, then certainly we can also see uh, a, a connection. Now, again, people can be very, very wealthy working for somebody else. So it's not to say that that can't work. Mm -hmm. But I do know there are a lot of people who work for other people who absolutely hate every minute of what they're doing, but they can't see a way out. But sure, they would love to be doing something that brings them more satisfaction and enriches their lives. And as I say, we live now at a time when all you got to do is go online and read or look at other people and what they're doing and learn from them. I'll give, give a quick example of that. What ben Settle, my email guru guy, when he's promoting a product, like an affiliate offer or something, or one of his own products, uh, and there's a deadline day, on that deadline day, you might get six, seven, or even eight emails from him. And it's insane. It's so over the top that you've just got to open them. You've got to say, who is this guy who would do this? And uh, he will get people saying to him, 
Ben, I like your content, but it's too many emails, so I had to unsubscribe. And I think, you know what? Okay, I get that you get a lot of emails, but my attitude and the reason I'm successful, and I'll just be blunt about it, is that instead of saying, oh, that's too many emails, I better unsubscribe, I think to the contrary, I'm going to study these emails because I know this guy is successful. Every one of these emails is a gem to me because it's a it's a thing I can learn from. So if you're getting emails from somebody who's really, really successful, don't say, oh, it's a nuisance. I, I don't want to read these. That's the wrong attitude. You're not going to go anywhere with that attitude. So – Anyway, so, learn, so the law, learn by imitation, I think, is what you're you're saying, right? Yeah, especially because it's so easy to identify people who are doing well, and with the internet, you can look at their blog posts, you can get on their email list. It's so easy; it's handed to you on a silver platter. Here's what this guy. Here's the stuff this guy emails to his list that generates sales. What are those things? Why do you think they're successful? You can learn all this stuff. It's easy to do. Uh, I mean, you know, if if you really want to apply yourself, you will learn a lot of principles. And you'll be able to exercise them, and you'll be able to have a life where you are free of a lot of the things that annoy you. There's a there's a great book by Harry Brown. I don't endorse every aspect of it, but how I found freedom in an unfree world. He doesn't just mean how did I find a, a state that has a lower income tax. He also means how did I get free of having to work with people I hate, or having to be in in situations that I hate, or or being poor all the time and not being able to have anything that I want. How can I get free from those things? Well, you can sit around and hope you get a raise, or you can take matters into your own hands and grab that freedom for yourself. And the only path to that that I see is entrepreneurship. That's great, Tom. I'll just add an amen for my part. I, I see in my own life, when I both when I was learning to be a web developer, uh, but then also starting a nonprofit, you know, I would go out and just like literally when I was a web developer, I would find websites that I liked and I would recreate them myself using their code and their graphics. But then I could have something to point to as a reference to say, hey, this works. I'm going to learn how to do that. And then similarly with a the nonprofit, there's so many great examples of, you know, think tanks and activist groups out there where I could say, I like that they do X and hey, this group does Y really well, where I could observe and imitate and blend that together. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't focus on today is, is standing on the shoulders of giants and imitating and recreating what they've done and also learning from their mistakes. I think that's a huge, huge key as well. Um, Tom, I'll, we're going to wrap it up there. I just want to say thanks for joining us on the inaugural episode. Um, your podcast is great. TomWoods.com, if anyone doesn't know about it. We'll link to all your stuff because I've built half your websites for you, so I know what they are. Yeah, they, <laughs> we'll, you know what they we'll are. Just Can link I to, add one thing? Please, go ahead. A, a thing to link to because uh, for, for that list um, – I wrote an ebook from scratch about how I do the affiliate stuff and oh, cool. how I monetize my podcast and stuff like that. So that that's a free ebook and that's at paths to income.com. Okay, great. We'll link to that on what would obviously be society and the state.com slash numero uno one. So thank you again, uh, Tom. We'll link to all your sites and point people to you. Um, I appreciate you coming on. I wanted to talk about something different because I sense that a lot of us go through these transitions. A lot of us have these fears you are a well-known person who has gone through this transition. And if people imitate you and learn from you, I think they're going to be well-served. So thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap of episode number one. Thanks for everyone. Brian, how do you think it went, our first episode? I think having Tom Woods as a headliner was a very wise choice. I, I think so, too. He's got a fantastic podcast. Um, and very grateful to him for coming on. Guys, be sure and subscribe to the show, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever you use. Uh, we have a ton of fun guests planned. We're very excited about the future. And we hope you'll stick around and join us on Society and the State. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. 